The sooner you get accustomed to it, or else, the better. The World Bank itself has recently indicated that 222 million people are already experiencing the threat of starvation, described oh so nicely as food insecurity. The communists managed to kill 100 million in the last century with their utopian delusions. We've barely begun to implement the save the planet nightmare, and we've already placed twice that number at risk. We are told an emergency confronts us, the climate crisis. The solution? The masses will have to tighten their belts to forestall an even worse future catastrophe. The elite academics, think tanks, and corporate consultants, and the politicians who subsidize their intellectual pretensions will not be particularly affected by such tightening, privileged as they are. But the actual poor? To such an elite, they must be sacrificed now to save tomorrow's hypothetical poor. And 222 million people is no doubt an underestimate as the food insecurity gets more severe, more countries will place restrictions on food exports. That will harm the international supply lines we all depend on. Then, when the consequences of that manifest themselves, increasingly desperate politicians will begin to nationalize and centralize food distribution, as the French and Germans have already done on the energy front, and cut their farmers off at the knees who will in turn stop growing food, not out of spite, but because of dire economic impossibility. Then we will have engendered the kind of feedback loop that can really spiral out of control. It will be poor people who die first, at least. But as we have all been taught by the malevolent eco-moralizers, the planet has too many people on it anyway. Think about this while you shiver all too soon in your cold, damp, and increasingly expensive and now substandard lodgings, you and your family may well have been deemed an expendable excess. Food for thought. This is simply not acceptable. If you dare to claim the moral high ground while serving the cause of starvation, then, by my reckoning, You've placed yourself firmly in the enemy camp, and you richly deserve whatever is coming your way. In the psychological and educational arenas, too, we demoralize young people, feeding them a constant diet of concretized apocalypse, focusing particularly on tempering or even obliviating the laudable ambition of boys, hectoring them into believing that their virtue is nothing but the force that oppresses the innocent and despoils the virginal planet. And if that doesn't work, and it does, then there's always the castration awaiting the gender dysphoric. And you oppose such initiatives at substantial personal risk. But we can reassure ourselves with the fact that a beneficent government is going to set up warm spots in public libraries and museums this winter so that freezing, starving old people can huddle together to keep warm while their grandchildren cough up their lungs in their frigid, damp, and moldy flats. In such circumstances, in the face of such mandatory privations and manipulations, it's obvious that the last thing our tyrannical, idiot, panicked, virtue-signaling governments should be doing is directing their demented attention toward regulating what people serve at their tables. But because meat has also been deemed yet something else that is destroying the planet, the woke narcissists of compassion are already insisting that people eat less of it. Plants and bugs for you and your children, peasants. And the sooner you get accustomed to it, or else, the better. Let's turn our attention to the claim that animal husbandry and the meat it produces cheaply enough for everyone to afford is unsustainable. For a moment, because we haven't yet dispensed with enough moralizing and authoritarian stupidity. Remember what happened the last time that government agencies applied their tender mercy to determining what the people they serve 
should consume? We were offered the much vaunted food pyramid, telling us to eat six to 11 servings of grains and carbohydrates a day, with protein and fat at the pinnacle, something to be indulged in with comparative rarity, if indeed necessary at all. That all turned out to be wrong, and not just a little wrong, but so wrong that it might as well have been not just wrong, but a veritable anti-truth, something as wrong as it could possibly get. The food pyramid was brought into being not least by the US Department of Agriculture, that is, by marketers, not scientists or nutritionists, with no shortage whatsoever of lobby efforts by those whose products ended up being promoted. The dietary recommendation to prioritize carbohydrates produced a veritable epidemic of obesity and diabetes, resulting in what has been deemed by reliable researchers as one of the worst public health disasters of all time, dooming almost the entire Western population to a lifetime of catastrophic chronic health problems. Yeah, so that's the false adventure sold to young kids. It's like, well, the planet's going to hell in a handbasket. That's the claim. It's like, yeah, yeah, the planet's always been going to hell in a handbasket, right? The apocalypse is always nigh. And that's because we die and so does everything else. And so, well, the apocalypse is nigh and you can save the world by protesting against those who are at fault. That's the, what the universities sell young people. Well, it's an adventure, right? They have a messianic urge at that age. And that really never goes away in people in some fundamental sense, but it's particularly acute when adolescents, late adolescents are trying to catalyze their identity and the left offers these false adventures. You can be, the, you, you print out a sign that says, I oppose poverty as if anyone doesn't. And you wave that around publicly, which is the same as praying in public, right? It's a great sin. And you proclaim your moral virtue and bang, that's your adventure. And it's a cheap, it's a cheap pathway to, to reputational accomplishment. And, and part of the reason young guys do it you know perfectly well is because they're trying to impress young women and it's kind of uh what would you say there's a surface a surface attraction to being a kind of rebellious quasi che guevara type and to be taking on you know the evil corporations of the world when you're 18 you know instead of working at 7-eleven and handing out sugar water to kids look guys you're gonna suffer. And most of them are already suffering, so they know that. It's like, and you wanna suffer stupidly too? Because that's even worse. And then you do you wanna contemplate for a moment what's going to be your arc when the storms come? Well, I can tell you what it is. And you already know this because you've consulted your own conscience. When you're awake at three in the morning thinking about what a useless bastard you are, how many sins you have on your conscience, if you're fortunate, there'll be a few of your adventures come to mind where you think, well, you know, I didn't do so bad then. You know, maybe there's something to me. And so what do people remember when they have those memories? They remember the times when they stepped outside of their narrow selves and took on some bloody responsibility, at least for themselves. And then maybe for someone else too. And then maybe for a lot of other people. And so if you tell young men, look, you're gonna find the meaning in your life by adopting by adopting maximal responsibility right that's going to be extremely difficult because you're so bloody useless you can't even get your own house in order and you're and you're going to be called upon not only to get your house in order but to do that well enough so some woman can stand having you around for more than like 15 minutes in the back of a car and then maybe you're going to have to do it so that you could be a good father to a family and a pillar of the community and that's not just empty words. Like, if you do that nobly, there'll be something to you. And then when the storms come, you won't be blown over by the first four foot wave. And young men think, huh, you mean I could be something that wasn't blown over by the first four foot wave? They think, oh, well, that's, that's, that's inspiring. Maybe that's worth doing a little work towards. It, on the off chance it might be true. And the thing about it is it is true. So it's not that difficult once you understand it to make a case for it.
It's true. And it is also true that you grow in proportion to the weight you take on voluntarily. And it's also true that we have no idea what the upper limit to that is, right? So, you know, you, you've met remarkable people in your life. People can do remarkable things. And there are inevitably people who, take, who took on remarkable burdens. And because they did that, their development was forced by necessity. They were forced by necessity to grow beyond what they were. And who knows what the limit to that is? Misplaced envy is a really big problem. Resentment's a really big problem. Historical ignorance is a really big problem. You know, I mean, pe people don't know how bad it was. They don't know how far we've come. They're never taught that. They're not taught how terrible things had become in many places in the 20th century. Like my students in my personality class, these were smart kids at the University of Toronto. They were well educated by, by comparative standards. None of them knew anything about what happened in Stalinist Soviet Union or in Maoist China or in Cambodia. No one had ever ta taught them. And so, so I, th I think, you know, young people, they, they see inequality in the world and they see some of the painful consequences of inequality because there are painful consequences. And then they're enticed into finding a quick source of blame that requires no thought and also enticed into manifesting a moral virtue that is neither moral nor virtuous. And so, and then, and so here we are. And instead of, uh, you know, I've thought for many years, decades, that whenever I walk out on the street and things aren't on fire, I'm pretty damn thrilled at how stable and peaceful things are. I don't take electricity for granted. I don't take the integrity of the supply chain for granted. I truly think these are miracles. I don't think the fact that the default interaction between human beings in, in, this, in the Western world, broadly speaking, the default economic transaction is based on trust. I don't take that for granted. That's a bloody miracle. It took us hardly any societies have ever managed that. And it took us thousands and tens of thousands of years to produce that. But I think children, our children are so badly educated by people who have no idea. They have no idea about economics. They have no idea about history. They have no idea about privation or suffering. They're looking for easy answers and, and, uh, and, and people to blame for the remaining, you know, catastrophes of the world. And I think your work is an unbelievably good antidote to that. And, and something to offer young people that's so bloody positive with the, and, and that it's, you know, miraculous and not naive at the same time. Like what a good combination that is. Well, here's, here's the question I love to ask my students is what would I have to pay you for you to never use your, your, your iPhone and the internet again for the remainder of your life? And mm -hmm. I've never get, I've never been able to get a student to, to do it for less than $5 million. It's like, mm -hmm. when you have this $5 million thing that you own. <laughs> you're all, you're all five millionaires because you get to walk around with these devices. Uh, oh yeah, you, definitely. You are, you are so prosperous, so rich compared to, to anybody that's come before you. How could you not be anything other than, than just, just hyper grateful for the life that we have? Well, you know, I, th I think that one of the things we need to do about this is we need to start training young people to think about themselves as possessed of more possibility than they know what to do with and then encouraged to harness that in it so it say well look you you have all the food that you could have and you have all the information that there is you've got it all in front of you now that you have it all in front of you what's the most noble vision you can bring forth to make use of that possibility you know and and I know some of the research I've done on helping people make a vision for the future, future authoring program, we show them pretty clearly that you can motivate students. We drop the dropout rate of boys in, in community college 50% by just having them sit down for 90 minutes and develop a vision. So you say, look, you look at what's in front of you, way more than anyone's ever had in history. And some people might have a little more in front of them than you, like certainly, but when you have more than you can ever use, how much do you need? And, and, and then who should you be to live up to that? Well, that's you know our collective problem at the moment, trying to solve that and hopefully solving it before we let bitterness and resentment and historical ignorance get the upper hand. Because 
It's kind of a battle at the moment with our computer technology. Every single child, I would say on the planet, but certainly in the, in the states where everyone has access to computational equipment, every single child should be an expert speed reader because computers could train children to automate letter, phoneme and word recognition perfectly rapidly because computers are great at mass practice. And if the faculties of education had an ounce of integrity, they would have been working diligently on the problem of getting children over that hump because there's a hump in reading comprehension, eh? Because to begin with, like there is when you're learning how to play music, you have to automate letter recognition and syllable recognition and word recognition and then phrase recognition. So you get a phrase in a at a glance. As soon as you've got that, you can start to read for meaning. It's no longer effortful. And then as soon as you can read for meaning, of course, it's it's just as engaging as watching a movie, which people obviously don't have to be taught to do. And so there are all these problems that are laying out there in the world and, and people have a set of problems that bug them that they could be working on fixing and they have all this technology to fix it. It's like, that's that's what you want to do is figure out what what you think needs to be fixed and then take all this wealth that you had put at your disposal and fix it, man. And then you got something to do with your life. And we could start with the proposition that it's good that you're around. You don't have to hang your head in shame because you're ruining everything. Quite the contrary. That's actually wrong. And I don't just mean wrong morally. I mean wrong in the sense you guys have pointed out. It's wrong technically. No, that's wrong. Those biologists got it wrong.